Welcome to the Northern Kentucky Spotlight Podcast presented by CBT. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Sarah Brookbank. Thank you to our podcast sponsors, CBG, our title sponsor, C Crew Consulting, our digital sponsor, and our episode sponsor, Haran. February is Black History Month. The Northern Kentucky Chamber of Commerce recognizes the importance of celebrating the diversity of our region and the talented individuals that make it unique. Throughout the month, we will spotlight some of Northern Kentucky's Black-owned businesses and our partner organizations throughout the region that are dedicated to engaging with and intentionally supporting Black-owned businesses across Northern Kentucky. Today on the podcast, we are joined by Melanie Murray, Marketing Manager of North America for Zombrero, who talks about their feel-good Mex food and how eating their benefits rise against hunger. On NKY at Work, Ashley Dubois, our DEI Director, has a discussion with Dr. Rhonda Talford-Knight, the Chief Diversity Officer of Brooker & Eckler. They highlight our upcoming DEI Summit Session Series, Recruiting the Region We Want, coming up on February 10th. But I will not spoil that great discussion, so let's go meet our members of the week and hear from our sponsors. CBG Airport is the lowest fare airport in the tri-state region with 54 nonstop flights and direct international service to seven destinations, including Paris, France, and now home to both DHLs and Amazon's global cargo hubs. The airport is furthering its position as leader in aviation and is deeply committed to being an economic driver for the community. You can learn more and start your next adventure at CBGAirport.com. Ranking on Google Search and Maps is easy to understand, but hard to do. It requires constant effort and attention, uploading new photos, responding to Google reviews, writing weekly posts, and checking suggested updates. Google listing optimization takes experience and time, and there are no shortcuts. C-Crew gives your Google My Business account the steady, consistent attention it needs to be effective, optimizing, updating, and expanding critical content every single week. From local retail stores to large regional networks, C-Crew generates content, establishes benchmarks, and creates dramatic measurable increases in engagement. So what can C-Crew do for your business? More calls, more clicks, more clients. Congratulations to our members of the week. You can learn more about these businesses by following the Northern Kentucky Chamber on social media where we will highlight one of these businesses each day. Now, let's meet our members of the week. Pods for Business offers portable commercial storage units and transport solutions for temporary storage, relocation, and shipping. Taylor Oswald is a minority-owned insurance and risk management firm dedicated to innovative solutions that contribute to clients' successes in today's changing world. AM Titan Group is a real estate development company that acquires, develops, and operates apartment communities in Northern Kentucky and Cincinnati. Layla Urgent Care offers quick and convenient access to medical treatment for non-life-threatening illnesses and injuries. School of Rock is a growing, passionate community dedicated to enriching lives through performance-based musical education. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. Today, we are joined by Melanie Murray, who is the marketing manager for Sombrero in the U.S. Melanie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yes, so you guys are new to the area. Uh, tell us about Sombrero. So Zimbrero is, um, like you said, relatively new to this area. Um, actually, is a concept that started in Australia in 2005 and has grown to a little over 200 locations down in down under in Australia. Um, have about a dozen locations in Ireland, uh, about the same in the UK. Um, we we came here to the states um, right around COVID ish, right prior to it hitting. Um, and obviously that kind of slowed things down from uh, obviously with restaurants and all of that kind of had to take a pause for a little bit. But um, we have since opened several locations and expanded some in the North Carolina market um, and then came here thanks to a, a franchise owner that um, he was actually from Australia and she was a Northern Kentucky franchise uh, um, business operator. And um, they decided to, to put the roots down here in the Midwest. And um, so I, I am the marketing manager for, for the U.S., for the brand, but live here in, in this area. So it works out really well because we do plan to do a lot of expansion um, in this area. Our first location um, was right outside the University of Cincinnati, mm -hmm. corner of Short Vine and, and um, Quarry. So uh, we're big Bearcat supporters down there right in the heart of Bearcat Nation. And then um, we opened the location here in northern Kentucky uh, right next to Starbucks. Um, where, the, where Izzy's used to be, mm -hmm. um, 
we, we occupy that space and it's really been a great opportunity for us because you know, Starbucks brings in a lot of great traffic. Yeah. And so um, people may see this and think, oh, I've seen her out at the Starbucks drive through But yeah, we, we have a really good relationship with Starbucks there and um, they let us kind of pass off samples and, you know, get, get good awareness mm -hmm. um, for our brand to their customers too, which is great. And we've, we've been... Uh, very well received in the northern Kentucky market in the yeah. last few months. Well, that is awesome. So you guys are right there on Mall Road. And so for people who are driving by and they're like, what the heck is Sombrero? What is it? What do you guys serve? So we are um, a Mexican-inspired QSR or quick serve. So um, very much like a Chipotle or a Qdoba, but but very different also. We um, I like to say when I'm you know talking to customers about it, even though you know maybe it's not the greatest to, to use a competitor's name, Chipotle is what everyone is, is familiar with. Right. Um, we are kind of a healthier, fresher version um, of that, but we also um, are mission-based. So for every bowl or burrito that you purchase, we donate a fortified meal to a, a hungry human in need through our Plate for Plate mission, um, which is, is supported through Rise Against Hunger. Mm -hmm. They are a humanitarian partner, international partner. They're actually headquartered out of Raleigh, North Carolina, okay. but our brand, um, Zimbrero, has been partnered with them since the very beginning. So Zimbrero has been partnering with this U.S.-based organization um, to get these fortified rice meal bags into um, the hands of some of the most malnourished in the world. Um, to date, we've donated more than 64 million of these rice bags wow. globally um, through our brand. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, everything that you're kind of used to, but in a different way. So, you know, you can get come in and get a bowl, a burrito, um, nachos, tacos. We have something called a Dos Capas, which is a hard shell, soft shell taco. Okay. Um, really good queso. I, I will say I think our queso is the best out of any any um, of the next inspired QSRs around here. A really good queso. We have... Um, some really great salsas, blended salsas, and just standard salsas. Um, and we have sauces. We have five different sauces that you can top your bowl or burrito or taco, nacho, um, or even quesadilla at the end um, mm -hmm. of your journey down the line there to, to build your, uh, what we call feel good max. So we say that, you know, our food's a little healthier and fresher, makes you feel good when you eat it, um, but you also are doing good when you're buying a bowl or burrito because we are then donating a meal on your behalf. So we call it Feel Good Mex. Yeah, that is incredible. And you just touched on so much. So let's break it down a little yeah, bit more. Yeah. One of the things I think is really interesting, uh, like you said, so everybody kind of knows those Chipotles, the Qdobas, that style. But it sounds like you guys have a lot more customization uh, that you offer to customers. We do. So, it, well, and I think what people would notice when they first walk in is that there's no grill, there's no fryers, there's none of that. Our proteins, our meats, are all um, in slow-cooked kettles, sous vide style. Okay. So it's almost like a kind of like that crock pot type um, cooking of your meats. So it, it really keeps that um, that taste, that flavor profile is pretty unbelievable. Um, it, it's not cooked in the Chipotle um, spices and all of that that you might be used to. And I know some people's bellies can't handle that. Whereas with ours, it's um, kind of more natural um, by way of the chicken, the, the beef, the pork. Um, we also have a three bean mix that's really de delicious. We can really cater to the vegans and vegetarians out there um, with a really great protein option in this three bean mix that we have. But again, you'll come in and see these four big kettles, country kettles, mm -hmm. and each of our proteins are, are housed in those. Um, so that right out of the gate makes it different. Um, then you come in and you have that jasmine rice. If you, if we don't have brown rice. We don't have, um, but we do have white jasmine rice and then black rice, which is another differentiator that you can get with us that you can't with, with some of the others. Um, black rice is, is um, infused with amaranth seeds. It's really, really high in antioxidants, um, way less full of carbs than what, you know, your standard rice would be. I try to encourage people, you know, at least we will always give you a sample if you want to try it. It's definitely a little harder than, than standard rice. I mean, you'll see that little seed that kind of gives it a nuttier profile. Um, but when you mix it in with all of these other really good foods that you're tasting, it just really gives it a good, wholesome taste. And you're not so full of carbs mm -hmm. the way rice does for our bellies. Um, 
So, but I encourage people, you know, go half and half with it for a while if you know you're not a little unsure. Um, but that certainly makes us different. All of our salsas, guac, everything is made right there in house and it's all as fresh as it can be. It's as healthy as it can be. You know, I mean, obviously you can add that sour cream and you can add yeah. that cheese and you and can the queso. add and yeah. all that queso. You can <laughs> add all of that stuff that you want to, but um, we, we really do our best to give our customers um, you know, something that's that's better and healthier for them than what they're typically used to in, in that environment. So. Yeah, that is very cool. And I'd love to talk a little bit more about this Rise Against Hunger Plate for Plate partnership. Mm -hmm. I know you guys pushed that really big in the holidays, that Plate for Plate initiative. But tell us a little bit more about like how that works and what people can expect uh, when they're coming to you guys and about that initiative. So. I mean, it, at the Florence location, you'll see um, we have one of our little rice bags at the very end, and it's next because we have we have some cookies and brownies if you want to mm -hmm. pick one up for dessert. Um, but near the cookies and brownies grab and go at the end, you'll always see our little rice bag, and I encourage folks to pick it up and look at it because it's really we see that kind of thing on TV, mm -hmm. but we don't really know what's in it. And I encourage people to go to our website zambrero.com, and you can click on the plate for plate um, section, and you can see. Um, really amazing videos of um, families and tribes that live by this food that we're, you know, making sure that we pass along through Rise Against Hunger through our customers. Um, that people have been, their lives have been changed mm -hmm. by these bags of food that we that we take. Um, our employees go on vision trips. Um, we haven't done it since pre-COVID, but where we'll go into um, these third world countries and work with these these folks, individuals that are you know, in these schools and that, that are um, receiving the food that our customers are so generously, when they have a meal, are donating. So um, so anyone can walk in and look at that bag, but it, there's information on the website, but within it is rice, hot, um, dehydrated vegetables, mm -hmm. uh, lots of pro, you know, nutrients. It, it's, it's really phenomenal what just this little bag can do for human beings. So um, like I said, that is, that's been one of the pillars of our restaurant brand from the very beginning, thanks to Sam Prince, who was our founder. Um, his, his family was from a very malnourished area, Sri Lanka, and um, he always you know, had this vision in the back of his mind that if he was successful in his life, he was going to give back. Yeah. He was going to give back um, in a way that touched his people and his family and where he came from. Um, and he's surely done that. And yeah. so uh, Rise Against Hunger is one of the most amazing humanitarian outreach organizations in the world that really, um, they touch so many people. And uh, when you know Sam Prince was looking for places that he could touch and organizations that would do it the right way, mm -hmm. Rise Against Hunger literally rose to the occasion and they've, they've been our partner ever since. So... Um, now that we're expanding in the U.S., it, it really is it is even closer to home for you know for the brand um, to to be able to do amazing things. Sam's goal was to hit a billion, to donate a billion meals by 2025, and so he knew that he wasn't going to be able to do that unless he brought his amazing food to the United States. Right, and so that's really what brought the brand to the U.S. was the mission. Yeah, to feed to feed a billion people, uh, or feed have a billion meals donated, and so like I said we're at uh, over sixty four million. When you walk into any Zambrero, the one in uh, Mall Road in Florence, you'll see the ticker. Yeah, on the left side of the wall, um, you can. And when you go to the plate for plate um, section of our website, it's always updated in real time. Um, so you can see, you know what you are contributing with people all over the world, Australia, the UK, New Zealand, Ireland, uh, and now the US. Um, yeah. Everybody kind of chipping in together to donate these meal bags. Um, it, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty yeah, cool mission. That is such yeah. an incredible mission. You know, uh, we are kind of in this day and age where there are so many uh, organizations that are looking for ways to give back. It's just really great to hear that that has just been ingrained in your company since day one. Yep. Very, very cool stuff. Um, and we kind of touched on this from that and when you were talking earlier about things that really make you guys different and make you stand out. Is there anything else about Zombrero that you really think 
differentiates you from competition? Well, certainly, certainly the product and certainly the mission. Um, I think too, you know, I came here to the to the chamber today before this and uh, brought a brought a catered meal for, and everybody was, you know, really loved it. And so, I, not that that makes us different because every brand out there can cater, but mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. But when you want something a little different, and when you want something that you know, we say. Let us nourish your crew. You know, it's not just feeding you something that, you know, you're going to be hungry in an hour or two or feeding you something that might not be something so good for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we couldn't come in with a, a Zimbrero bowl bar or a Zimbrero um, burrito bar or, I'm sorry, taco bar, nacho bar, and just lay it all out on the table. And, and you can, it's just like a bar going to, an, you know, an open bar and picking yeah. anything that you want. Um but it's different. It's different, you know. And, and employ as employees uh, of a employer that brings a, a meal in like that, it, it's just something different and, and kind of a notch above what yeah. you're used to from a catering standpoint. So, um, yeah, I think we have a lot to offer. Um, I'm excited to see this brand grow because I believe in it. You yeah. know, I believe in uh, I believe in the product being a lot better. I eat it three or four times a week, and it, it's just it makes my body feel good. You know, instead of making me feel swollen or, mm -hmm. or you know, tired heavy. or what have you. Heavy, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I just feel good after I eat it. You know, you can customize in a lot of different ways. We have a, a nourish bowl that's actually, it's what I eat every day just about, um, it, which has some kale slaw in it. It has the black rice in it. It has guac and tomatoes and corn. And I like it with a three bean mix, but it's really good with the chicken also. Um but, you know, just very different products that um, that make us, I think, a, a kind of a notch above. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I'm a little biased, so right. <laughs> I encourage everybody to try it for yourself. So. Yeah. And then before I let you go, I did want to touch on the catering, uh, mostly because I saw the spread that you had set out in the conference room here at the chamber. So can you tell our viewers and listeners like what all you guys have to offer when it comes to a catering standpoint? Sure. And again, our website has all of this information, but uh, our catering options really... Um, are in three different pillars. So you can either get a burrito box. So it's basically just, you know, you go on the website, you can choose either beef, chicken, a combination of such, um, vegetarian, what have you. Um, we'll put it all together. Everything's already pre-made. Um, and then we just bring the burrito boxes out or you can pick them up, what have you. Um, then we have um, build your own bars. So it's basically um, either a taco, a nacho, or um, a bull bar any of those. Um, we do ask that those are a minimum of 20 okay. because obviously the packaging has to be a little bigger and, and all of that. So we, we will not be able to, to do anything less than 20 when it comes to the bar. But the bars are actually really great when you have you know 20 or more like today. Um, then people can really customize and do whatever they want and they can see what right. a large selection of, of different items that we have. Um, and then we also have an a la carte burritos and bowls option. So if you've got, you know, say 10 people or 15 people um, that, that you'd like to do a, a group lunch for or a staff meeting or what have you, you can go in there, click on that button, put everything in that everybody wants each customized, and then just send it on through. Okay. Um, so, yeah, very self-explanatory. And, and two, I would love to offer free chips and guac. For any businesses that you know mention this Northern Kentucky Chamber podcast in the month, month of February and uh, want to do a catered um, meal for us, let us cater for you. We'll give you some free chips and guac with that for your staff. Yeah, well, honey, that February. is so nice. Yeah. Thank you so much for that for our viewers yeah. and listeners. That's really generous of you yeah. all. Yeah, and our guac is really the best guac, I have to say. <laughs> it is really, it's good stuff. So That is awesome. And Melanie, before I let you go today, is there anything else you want to share with our viewers and listeners about San Bernardo? I would just, I would love for you guys to give us a shout. Come and see us at the at the Florence location. Come in and see how many uh, on the wall there, how many bowls and burritos that people have eaten globally, so that uh, we can donate those meals, that many meals to uh, to those in need. And and come check out check out something different, a little bit healthier, a little bit fresher. Yeah. Well, Melanie, thank you again for your time today. I really appreciate Thanks you so coming much. on. Thanks so much. Hi, and welcome to the Northern Kentucky At Work Podcast. My name is Ashley Dubois, and I am here with Dr. Rhonda Telford-Knight, Chief Diversity Officer at Brickard Eckler Attorneys at Law. 
We're here talking about our DEI Summit Series, which is taking place on February the 10th, 8.30 to 10.30 at Thomas More University. Dr. Knight, thank you so much for being with us. Hello, I am so excited to be here and super excited about being able to serve on that panel. I am elated that you are doing this work because I think sometimes just sharing information out and hearing from folks and allowing people to ask questions and engage is just half the battle. So super excited. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about what's the most exciting part of your work? Ooh, the most exciting part of my work. Um, you know what? Literally, it's the things that I don't know are coming sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yes, because, you know, I can plan, there's a strategy, there's implementation, right? But it is walking into the room and being invited to a meeting and, you, you, you know, you have an understanding of what that meeting is and what we're about to accomplish. But it's really being able to tap into the expertise that I have. Um, what's exciting, though, is to see people around the room that sometimes I don't even have to say anything, yeah. right? So I get to see growth in real time. Yeah. And that for me is exciting. Um, when people knock on my door, you know, literally in, you know, not so literal, mm -hmm. whether it's the email, hey Rhonda, can we, can we do this? Or how can we approach this? Or I have this idea. That to me is exciting. Yeah. Because as you can, as you can see, I love this work. Yeah. And I can, we can put a bunch of things on the table. But it's when people knock on my door, I think, is, is and, and they have the ideas to drive DEI is, is really exciting yeah. for me. What was the biggest challenge you had to overcome in this role? Well, so what I'll say is, it just in thinking about it from a holistic standpoint, it was first understanding that they had a strong foundation with DEI. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I wasn't walking into a space ground level they need to level set in and talk about DEI okay. and, and how to define it. Now, mind you, there's still some level setting, but one of the things for me was while working as a consultant, I'd had some, you know, work with a law firm, you know, um, I didn't, I didn't work in the law firm, uh -huh. right? You know, have some friends who are attorneys, right? Great people, yeah. right? <laughs> know how they think, uh -huh. right? how they operate, but there's still a difference in working in a law firm. Yes. So for me, what, what really drew me to it was the foundational piece that they had. So I knew my challenge was going to be understanding the legal industry, that firm. Yeah. But so because I had that consulting firm, professional services, I had to always jump in and learn in industry anyways. Yeah. And so knowing how to do that, and I'll go back to that word that you, you use, the relationships. Mm -hmm. It was making sure that I took the time to build the relationships um, with folks across the firm and then learn um, more about who they are in the community. And I wouldn't really use it, um, use the word challenge, but it was something that had to be built into me coming into this role as a first time, you know, person and not just first time, but new to the industry as well. But they understood that. The great thing about Bricker was that they went into it saying, we want an expert in this space as opposed to here's an attorney that's maybe done, you know, labor and employment law, yes. right? Um, they said they wanted an expert in DEI to help drive, you know, the work of DEI within the firm. That to me spoke volumes because when you have experts, you know, it, they sometimes look to the other experts, yes. right? Yes. Um, and so this person, you know, has only this expertise. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was actually refreshing that they wanted someone with the expertise that wasn't going to be practicing um, law, that wasn't going to be expected to practice law, but that could also right be an add-on when when necessary or needed to some of the services that they provided yeah. and so that piece of it was you know for them sometimes how do you find that way to integrate you know DEI into maybe some of the things that they're already doing yeah. and they've done a great job yeah. oh they've done a great job of it yeah. yes yes so yes, can yes. you tell us a little bit about Bricker's makeup so Okay. Your attorneys, I'm assuming you have people who are not practicing attorneys in the firm as well, or are you the only non-practicing attorney? Oh, yes. So, yes. So, our firm, um, you know, we do have other, I'll say chiefs. So, we have an operations team. Okay. And so, I am one of the only roles in the operations team that actually reports to the managing partner. Okay. So, um, you have your, you know, chief DEI officer and, oh, let me go back, and your chief operations officer who reports to the managing partner. But then we also have a... Chief of HR, we have a chief talent, 
And um, we just had a chief BD person. Um, so and then we have other directors. And so the law firm, which I think, I, I think some people may not, uh, may be mystified by this, but has a whole host of folks working within the firm to help support the attorneys and the work that they do. Okay. So you have a whole, we have an entire operations team. Um, we also have, um, you know, folks from, you know, whether it's finance, right? I forgot, you know, a finance person, mm -hmm. right? The chief finance officer. And so for us, there is a great deal of people, you know, that support our lawyers and they're not just legal assistants and paralegals. Okay. They're literally operations people to ensure not just are they getting the work done, are they being developed, yes. right? And so that's kind of new, yeah. right? Because attorneys come in, they have their practice, they have their expertise, they drive and do that. Yeah. Well, guess what? there's a whole you're managing people so what does it look like to manage people yeah. so that's a big part of the conversation that we're having now but also it's retaining that's the people, fun word. right so how are we retaining mm -hmm. you know our people and and right now i'm going to put this out there our our attorneys from underrepresented groups right you know there are conversations around women Right, women in the legal space, yeah. women in the legal industry, and what has happened because of COVID. But also, we just had hosted a conversation yesterday with a group of our women attorneys um, about what does it mean to, you know, make equity partner. What does it mean to be a partner? What does it mean to be an associate? But what does it mean for that to happen here? Yes, and to get the support, knowing that historically this is a white man led industry yeah. and let me also interject with white straight, straight male, male yeah. industry yeah. right not to say that the other demographic labels don't exist they do but understand what the industry has been yeah. and so recognizing you know the mindsets that that exist intentional and unintentional yeah. and how we engage in those conversations yeah. well we could go into many different yeah ways, it was like this right I, I love retention and i love the conversation around it yeah i would just want to make a quick plug and ask you are yes. you a deia person or are you a deib person? ah so let's talk about that right <laughs> So let me, let me, tell me what your A stands for. Accessibility. Because, okay. Cause there's accessibility. Yes. Um, there's advocacy. Is I've heard one? of this one. Yes. Yes. Um, and Justice is another one. Yes. Yes. So what I say is DEI is DEI. Belonging is the outcome. Ashley. So we don't have to say the word so, belonging. No. I because it. what I'm striving for is that outcome of belonging. Yeah. If I am conscious and aware of the diversity, right, that needs to exist, yeah. include those folks, right, with intention, mm -hmm. right, but then also ensuring that there's equity within that, right, yeah. process, procedure, yeah. right, because we got to talk about process and yes, procedure, right? So if all of that is equitable, right, and I'm doing all of those, the you outcome is belonging. belonging. Yeah. Yes, the outcome is belonging. Yeah. So when people want to, you know, add that word to it, okay, that's fine. But just know that's what, and we want outcomes. Yes. We are driving for outcomes. So all that data that we have, the belonging piece is it. I can say I'm retaining our people because we're doing DEI yeah. the way that we're supposed to, yeah. right? Yeah. At least that's what we're working towards. And I, I love that. And I've, I've been asking a lot more professionals about this because mm -hmm. As you, as a professional, you walk into the room and people are using language, and I'm usually going, I'm going to be the pest in the room. And can you tell me what you mean by that? And right. why are you using this particular letter over this letter in right. this context? Like right. maybe it's a different context. And, right. and we were talking about this. And education might look different, and nonprofit mm -hmm. sector might look different because our outcomes are going to be different. Exactly. And exactly. so when we walk in and people have asked us here at the chamber, why have you not added on another letter? <laughs> well, and I'm just like, we can alphabet soup this thing all right. day. Right. I want to get to the nitty gritty. It's right. giving people what they need. Right. Um, and right. I was at a conference where the the speaker who was phenomenal said, at the end of the day, all of this will boil down to one thing. It matters to me because it matters to you. And that's it. That's it. And I thought that was really powerful. And it's a very succinct statement to mm. be able to say, I don't have to try to tell you why this is important or anything mm -hmm. like that. Is it important to you? And that's what you need to make sure that you're successful in this workforce. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, you know, and, and what I'll do is I'll go back to even the A word, the accessibility, access, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of my PhD work, we, we, that was foundational, access and accessibility. Yeah. That's the equity. It is. Right. Because yeah. when you look at doing the work from an equity standpoint, again, I'll go back to that, the, the, the piece, the process, the procedures. Mm -hmm. Right. You're making sure that they're accessible. Yeah, that's that's the equity. So if, if you want to use the word accessibility within that, 
okay, that's yeah. fine. <laughs> but but understand that through the equity, we're getting there. Yeah. So all those people who want to say, we need to stop doing DEI or why are we using the word diversity? Well, okay, we can use some different words, yeah. but the idea really is to ensure mm -hmm. that all folks, A-L-L, mm -hmm. all folks, right, have an opportunity to advance. Yes. And we recognize what is needed is different for each individual yeah. in order for them to advance. Yeah. And so that's my job, right? So it doesn't stop or start just with folks from underrepresented groups. Yeah. That includes my straight white men as well. Mm -hmm. And that is a big conversation where for a long time, because the way that we've been using the term diversity, it has been thought or felt like we're excluding straight yeah. white men. No. It's an othering. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, we are all at the table. And so to that point, Part of the part of what I say is, you know, everybody everybody says, make sure you have a seat at the table. Well, you can have a seat at the table, but we all know that you can have a seat at the table, not have a voice, mm -hmm. and not be heard. Mm -hmm. So what I say is, let's dismantle the table. Let's bring in our own piece of the table. Yeah. Everybody brings a piece in, and it comes together to yeah. create a new table, yeah. right? A mosaic of sorts. Oh, right? So therefore, we know that when we all push up to the table, every voice is there, it's intentional. There's no question about whether or not I'm supposed to be at the table yeah. because it's a part of my table too. Yeah. Yeah. I love that as a concept. Mm. That is yeah. so Thank good. You. Thank you. So if you talk, we talked about a little bit about retention yes. and the summit that we have coming up, we're talking about um, recruiting and retaining this workforce. Yes. Mm -hmm. DEI is in the retention part. Mm -hmm. How much of DEI is a part of the recruiting process? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Because that looks a little bit different. Who's yes. recruiting? Where are we recruiting? Uh, what what qualifications are we looking for? Maybe what what sector we need in law? Is it employment? Is it you know family? What is what is it that we need? And then who's practicing? I think a lot of people go in, and if I'm not mistaken, in law you kind of pick a track, so corporate or yeah. this or that. But I think yes. you can be trained in other things when you get there and make yes. a pivot as necessary. Yes. yes. So I don't know if we have any statistics around. Uh, underrepresented groups going into certain portions of law mm -hmm. and how much are the law firms actually recruiting for those people right at that moment so that might be a two-part question yeah. but how much is DEI in the recruiting phase yes. oh because yes. we have to recruit them in order to retain oh, them that's right that's <laughs> right and we have to be intentional yes. about that recruitment yes and so what I say is we're not recruiting we're recruiting for diversity with underrepresented groups oh okay I like so I'm that. very intentional yes the because, is good right because when we say diversity what happens, that's everybody. Everyone. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's why white men have thought they were excluded because people would say, well, I want it to be diverse. Well, okay, it's diverse, but that's everybody at the table. Mm -hmm. What I say is that we're recruiting for, whether it's historically underrepresented groups, where it means my focus is race, mm -hmm. or it's underrepresented groups, which means those are those other demographic labels outside of white male. Mm -hmm. okay. So for me, when we go into that with that mindset and everybody around the table, at Bricker at least, knows that we're using language very specific to how we're recruiting yeah right so that means we are conscious of are we looking for this demographic group or this demographic group right or even this demographic group mm -hmm. you know and so having that understanding right but then also going back to what you said it matters where you go mm -hmm. it matters it matters where you go yeah. and it matters how you show up when you get there, yes. right? So let's be clear, a part of when I knock on the door, I'm knocking on the door of law schools, and I'm saying, hey, I wanna make sure that we're building an intentional relationship with your folks from underrepresented groups, yeah. because when it comes to recruitment, right, I want them to know that Bricker, this mid-sized firm, is interested in them, and they're not in Columbus, Ohio, mm -hmm. right? So what I'm doing is something probably a little bit different than some law firms where we go to the top schools, we get the top percent, right? And, and, and not recognizing that, first of all, to say that we're only recruiting for the top percent, well, research already shows, right, that our students from historically underrepresented groups of color, let me just put it clear, yeah. of color, black and brown, okay, do not fare well when it comes to grades, yeah. right? That's research, yeah. it's proven, yeah. right? And so I need my folks to understand that, hey, let's equalize this and make this accessible. Why not have a writing sample? Why are we asking for writing samples, right? Because that's what we need. Right, right, <laughs> exactly, yeah. right? Didact the names because again, yes. we need to make sure that yes. you don't know, right? Or 
that you don't have the impression, mm -hmm. right, that this is someone from, right, this group. Yeah. So, 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 you know, there's that piece of it. But there's also, yeah, I'm going to still look in my front yard. Don't get me wrong. I'm yeah. still going to look in my front yard, but I'm going to look in my backyard, and I'm going to look down around the corner as well. So what we've done is we've established relationships with Notre Dame Law School. Um, fortunately, we actually, well, not fortunately, but ironically, our managing partner is a Notre Dame Law School grad. Well. That was, I know, right? <laughs> right? Well. Um, one, of our, one of my partners um, in DEI with the firm who is a, is a partner, his wife is a um, Notre Dame Law School grad as well. She doesn't work for Bricker, but she's a black female in-house um, to help support, you know, that relationship, that introduction. Yeah. And then we have some other folks in our firm that are Notre Dame Law School grads. But again, we're not... We're not located where they are, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that we can't recruit there. Because here's what we know. We know that graduates of color will go where the job is. Yes. They are looking to go. So it doesn't have to be in their backyard. And sometimes what we know in those conversations is they want to leave the front yard, yeah. right? Because it will allow them to really start on their own and not sometimes be pulled in many in the many directions that they get pulled in, yeah. especially when they're first gen, mm -hmm. right? So the intention is where we're going. We're also establishing, and actually, ironically, I am leaving Thursday, headed out to New Orleans, um, Southern University, um, Southern University Law Center, and we're going to establish a relationship with them because mm -hmm. if, if you know, it's it's predominantly it black, black students, yeah. right? So therefore really excited about that because there's more intention, right? Part of what um, we hear all the time, and this goes across industries. Oh my gosh, my eyes, I gotta be careful. Because it's, it's one of those statements that you hear all the time. Where are they? There, there isn't any. We don't know where to find them. And that's, so make that statement, right? But I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you that with some intention, yeah. even your predominantly, your PWIs, your predominantly white institutions, still have the ability where you can go and recruit there, yeah, right? Absolutely. So again, it goes to intention. It's recognizing that each law school has, you know, um, uh, affinity groups around, right? Those um, demographic labels. How are you building those relationships? Yeah. And I want those relationships to be deeper than, oh, here's a recruiting opportunity. Bricker has shown up. No, they need to know us. Yeah. What other ways can we tap into, right, building a real relationship? Yeah. So while you're building the relationship internally, that's why DEI is not just an internal piece. It's how am I building the relationships externally with where the places I'm going to recruit from. Yeah. But here's that second piece, right? Because, you know, some people will say, well, you're going to the law school. You're not going to need that many associates. What about the laterals? Well, guess what? If I'm building a relationship with the law school, there's alums. They will see mm -hmm. that Bricker is committed, right, to the work yeah. of recruitment and retention. Yeah. So I'm building, right, at the law school level, but to have exposure mm -hmm. beyond that. Yeah. So I need people to, right, really understand that while your entry point is one place, the access point should reach out yeah. and go further. So you're that. essentially building a very intentional and deliberate pipeline. Ex ah, there's you're the building word. building a pipeline. That's exactly it. It's and a pipeline. that's what we talk about a lot, is yes. building a pipeline. Exactly. And like those questions when you yep. said, you're like, watch my eyes. I'm like, oh, there goes yeah. the rug. <laughs> but wait a minute, let me, let me also add this piece. Because, because here's the thing about it. The conversations I had with some of these law students that will graduate and go into their first firm. Yep, I'm going to say it, their first firm. Yes, many people go into that first firm and stay, mm -hmm. but not all of them, yeah. right? So guess what? They get to then remember and recall Bricker yeah. Yeah. at the entry point, yeah. create the pipeline through the relationships. Yeah. And so there's, so I'm very intentional about what that looks like. Yeah. yeah. This mm -hmm. the, for our panel is, yes. are we hoping to see growth in real time okay. or are you hoping to plant seeds uh, with this panel at the summit series on Friday? So as a former educator and, you know, once a former educator, you're always an, always educator, an educator, right? <laughs> That's just who you are. It's plant seeds. Okay. Right. You, you do want to see growth in real time. And, and so as, as an educator, you see the light bulb going off for yes. people. And that is like, right. Amazing. Yep. But for sometimes, for some people, it is planting seeds. And one of the things that I absolutely have loved in doing this work and, and as an educator, 
is when people circle back and come back to you. Yeah. Because what I say, you know, as an educator, you, you sometimes didn't get to see, right, the growth, mm -hmm. right? You, you may see some things in real time, but the full growth. Yeah. And so as a former educator, I've had folks reach out to me that I've taught, oh my gosh, in middle school and high school. Google is a thing and I'm yes. not even on Facebook, right? <laughs> oh, but they still find you, yes. right? And so when you know that you've planted that seed, oh, that's all that you can ask for, yeah. right? Because when that seed has been planted, oftentimes people will go to look to get it watered. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes they'll circle around to you. They may circle around to somebody else you know. Yeah. But I think that that planting that seed is, is what we should all be empowered yeah. and think about being able to do. Yeah. I love this so much. Yeah. We're not going to give them everything. Okay, we're not. So okay. come back on Friday. And join us, DEI Summit Series, Friday, February 10th, 8.30 to 10.30 a.m. at Thomas More University. Dr. Rhonda Knight is going to be one of our panelists, so we're really excited. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. Come on back anytime. Uh, the invite, I will take it. You let Please. me know. <laughs> and we'll see you all on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Hi, I'm Shannon Schumacher, Account Executive, Kentucky Market Leader. At Haran, we champion bold innovation to help employers and individuals thrive. As an industry thought leader, we explore new horizons in healthcare, benefits, employee engagement, and wellness. We work harder to deliver all the strategic benefits, planning, and execution you expect from a true partner. And we do it with laser focus on your short and long-term outcomes to help manage your benefits while improving your employee experience. Thank you all for joining us today. Don't forget to mention the Northern Kentucky Spotlight podcast this month if you visit Zombrero to get some free walk and chips. And if you want to learn more about the strategies you can use to recruit new talent and retain the talent that you've already recruited, don't forget to sign up for the DEI Summit Session Series, Recruiting the Region We Want, happening on February 10th. You can still register for this event at nkychamber.com slash events. Thank you once again to our podcast sponsors, CVG, Secret Consulting, and Haran. Finally, if you are a member who would like to be featured on the podcast, or if you're interested in becoming a member of the Northern Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, please reach out to Lynn Aitlin. Or if you're interested in sharing your workforce strategies and resources on NKY at Work, please reach out to Nancy Spivey. You can find their contact information on the screen in front of you or at our staff directory at nkychamber.com. Thanks again for joining us. I'll talk to you guys next week.